everybody. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to the November edition of the home base meetups. We are very glad as a home base team to have you here with us today. And we are very excited to present with you this uh, home base meetup, which I'm sure Justin will go in more detail about. We even have some power school guest attendees to, to show you some things uh, that are upcoming. And if you would, please, Justin's mentioned it a couple times, but you see the link for the slides is there where it says slides. And the sign in link is down in the bottom right corner that I believe Tessa has dropped both of those into the chat. So if you would, please just uh, make sure to get the slides and also to sign in so that we know that you've been here today. Next slide, please. Whoop. There is our social media, all our call signs, everything that we have out there for the products at home base, NC home base, hashtag North Carolina school net, facebook.com, North Carolina home base. These are all the different ways we try to make sure to keep everyone up to speed with what's going on with home base. And we're going to talk more about that a little bit later today. And as I think you'll see on one more slide, there's the sign in and the slides for the opening session. And if you would please do those, it's obviously important to us. Next slide, please. And welcome to WebEx. We're in WebEx uh, today. And remember that if you have a question and you put it in the QA, the panelists will be the only ones who can see it. However, if you put it in the chat, if you have something that you place in the chat versus the QA, every single person on this um, event will be able to see what you say. So just remember that as you're choosing what to put where. Also, if you um, are asked to, or if you want to speak, or if Justin gives the opportunity for you to ask a question that way, please remember to unmute yourself at the bottom and then you can ask your question and then mute yourself back. Uh, next slide, please. I think I'm doing pretty good on that one. John Tessa would have filled me if I wasn't. We are here to foster productive field-based relationships. I have said, including back to my time when I was on in, in the district, I believe home-based meetups are very important for lots of reasons. One, DPI gets the opportunity to talk to you in the field about how things are going. And, and we are then able to get feedback from you about what we can do maybe a little bit differently to, to provide you with a better experience. The networking is unbelievable at a meetup, the opportunity to talk to other people who are in similar positions as you, to work through problems that you're having. I, I think it's, a, it, it's just, these are really good things for the state of North Carolina. Next slide, please. Uh, we are going to follow kind of the same pattern and, and agenda that we started last home-based meetup. We are going to offer a CEU credit for anyone who needs those. And we are also going to have a home-based advisory member kind of give a welcome message to you once Justin kicks in. And there is the agenda, um, the slides for the November open that we're currently going through. Next slide, please. Today is one of my favorite days for home-based meetups because you can get a double dose of the home-based meetup. Not only can you have power school this morning, but you can have learning.com today at one o'clock if you're interested in attending that home-based meetup. We had two previous home-based meetups on Monday. We had Nisus and Cami did a great job and John did, did a great job with his yesterday for SchoolNet. And tomorrow we have Canvas, and then on Friday we have Go Open NC, uh, which continues to grow every day. Uh, and I appreciate all of the home base team folks for their hard work putting these presentations together for you in these meetings. Next slide, please. There is the home base schedule. Again, we're going virtual uh, for this year currently. Sorry, I have a five-year-old behind me who's on asynchronous learning day, if, if y'all heard him. On November, we have 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. And then we're going to meet again in February 15th through the 19th and April 26th through the 30th as we kind of sum up the year in April. 
And then uh, please make sure you come in to come to these. We think they're very important. One of the things I do like to point out about it being virtual is you get to hear it one time from one source and, and the message can't change through various days. Next slide, please. We are home base, which is a part of digital teaching and learning with DPI. I think the digital teaching and learning has been working very hard to make sure that you have all the resources out there. So I always want to take this opportunity to provide you with the digital teaching and learning website, the North Carolina remote learning resources and information for dealing with through and working through COVID-19 and the different types of learning we're in. And then lighting our way forward, which covers the three plans and, and kind of what's expected. So these resources are out there for you as we continue to work through this <laughs> challenging times and ed giving people high quality educational resources delivered to them at home or in a classroom. Next slide, please. And we can't leave out the home base website. Please make sure you visit the home base website. This home base website is a great place to go for resources for all things home base, especially if you're dealing with um, the SIS, for example, all the resources that are available, the QRDs, the, the webinars, training information, it's all there. Next slide, please. One of the things, one of the things that we are trying to do is increase our home base social media footprint. So what you see here is an example of lots of the things that we are doing uh, with our Did You Know series that we're gonna be doing on Wednesdays. Of all the different products, here's an example of webinars for learning.com. You have some information about Go Open, Canvas, and Nesis. Uh, and, and the Nesis, did you know there, is how do you handle remote observations? That's just quick little tips and resources that we can provide to you from our Facebook page. Next slide, please. So please, there you go again. The did you know is every Wednesday, home-based topics, and there'll be links to resources. Remember to like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and follow us on Twitter. Help us get to 500 likes. It is my hope that if everyone who attends the home-based meetups goes and likes our Facebook page, we will be very close to that, if not surpass that by the end of the week. So please make sure that you're keeping up to speed with all the relevant information that we have and can provide you. Next slide, please. Uh, I do want to give a, a couple pieces of key information about home base since I have this opportunity with, with such a good group. Uh, please remember if you're using learning.com, tier one funds will revert back on November 30th if they're not spent. For Imagine Math, we have 28 slots available. Please, if you are interested, email Dr. Carmela Fair. And we have some webinars up this week and early next week uh, for those who are interested in what that product is and what it can do for you. Next slide, please. Uh, last week, you, with Canvas and Canvas funding, you know, PRC 165 and 166 is out there. Uh, Pam did a great webinar with Jill Darrow, and it is actually linked to that. Um, slide deck on the here. If you click on here, it'll take you to the webinar so you can get all that key information about what what's upcoming for those two, two items. And then for PowerSchool, the two biggest things, there's always something to talk about, but the two biggest things that we just want to make sure we keep on your radar is that core contacts are going to shift in January and no longer use the North Carolina contact screen. I'm sure that there's a large amount of applause in the background that I can't hear right now. And then we're going to upgrade to 1911.2.3 in December, which is a minor upgrade. We will have a more major upgrade um, a little bit later in the in the spring, probably around the EOY timeframe. Next slide, please. And please, folks have been doing very, very well. Uh, communicating with us who all their power school leads are and their unified talent and their school net leads. It's just important for us to know who are the right people to talk to, as well as for other districts to know who are the right people to talk to. So please continue to let us know which folks are doing all that work on your in your districts. And I know in a lot of cases that one name could do multiple things. 
So please just make sure that we are being up to speed with who, who is doing what in your districts. Next slide, please. And we have, this is now the third home-based meetup this week. As you can see, the slide decks are there. So as the week continues, the slide decks will grow. And on Friday, if you come back to this slide deck, you will see that all of them are filled out. So you will have everything that occurred during uh, the home-based meetups here on this one page. So I think it's very productive for you to come back here and review everything that was discussed. And all as always, we are here at home base are here for you to answer your questions. So if you see something in there, please reach out to me, reach out to the product managers, and we'll be happy to get you the answers that you need. Next slide, please. Hang on. It's coming. And there's supposed to be there it comes. One of this is probably the most important slide on this on this slide deck. Um, we are not going to probably see you again until after the holidays and after Thanksgiving break. So what I do want to do is from the home base team with you and your family a happy Thanksgiving. And please know we are we've all been working very, very hard. I look forward to a few days off to spend time with family. I hope that you will also have the opportunity to spend a, a, a little bit of time with family and just take a, a good rest because I feel like since March, we've run a marathon that has stopped. So please have a happy Thanksgiving and a happy holidays from everybody at DPI. Next slide, please. And this is our wonderful team. Uh, myself as the home base manager, Pam Batchelor, Justin Connor, Cammie Naren, Tessa Hine, John Mayers, Yolanda Wilson, Audrey Long, and Russell Dixon is back. Probably another round of applause there going up a, a, across the state. Uh, Russell Dixon is back to help us. We're very thankful to have him on board and on our team and doing wonderful things for us. And I also need to mention that Dr. Carmela Fair is also helping us out with Imagine Math and she's doing a fantastic job. So I would be remiss if I didn't uh, mention her name on this, on this list of folks. So uh, that is all that I have. I wanna thank you very much. Remember, we are here to serve you and I hope everybody has a wonderful break next week. Thank you, Justin, take it away. All right. All right, you should already have this. Hopefully everybody signed in, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started because we've got some guests today and we need to be to a place where we can stop at 1045. So welcome, looks like we've got a large group today and I think you'll be glad you joined. For those that couldn't join, we will be sharing this out later this week. This is being recorded again. Um, so our agenda, um, we're gonna get an introduction from Home Base Advisory Member Jay Parker. Thank you, Jay, for agreeing to meet with us today. Um, I'm gonna to try to cover all of our updates in around 30 minutes. And then we've got Victor and Lorenzo from Power School who will take over the rest of the meeting. And then we'll wrap up with some Q&A. With that said, Jay, thanks for joining. I'll turn it over to you. Hey, good morning. It is it is so good to be here today and be part of this um, home base meetup. And I just want to welcome everybody and thank you for joining. Um, it's November and we made it this far. So uh, that's a congratulations to everybody in the K-12s. So I'm speaking to you from a K-12 school district in Union County, North Carolina. We're in Monroe, just south of Charlotte for those that are not familiar where we are. We have uh, 40,000 students, 53 schools. Um, I have three awesome power school uh, team members and Beth Broadway, Amy Creswell and Leah Kroon. Um, they they support us and keep us running. We have 53 data managers in our schools that perform the duties every day. So um, I wanna say thank you to that team. First of all, I would be remiss without thanking them. Um, it is great to be here and just wanted to give you some updates about 
um, being the chief technology officer here and talk about security, um, how robust we need to make it, um, how we need to integrate all of ours, and a heightened awareness also. So um, we had the same challenges that every other school district did or charter school, starting school. Um, I think Union County was the only one in the state that went that started at 25% um, per day, Monday through Thursday. And um, we had Fridays as remote learning days. Uh, we started very slow to ensure that we could run fast later. Um, we wanted to ensure that all of our safety protocols, uh, measures were in place and that we understood how to conduct um, school without risk of students or staff. So we started at 25%. Uh, we slowly moved to 50% two days a week um, after the first month of school. And then uh, with the governor's announcement, we moved to the four days with our elementary K through five students. And then um, we still kept our remote learning days, both for the staff and students. I think it's been um, a nice um, break in the week and uh, time for students to catch up on homework and for staff to uh, complete assignments and then post them to Canvas. So um, it's it's been busy and we've experienced the same challenges also of students going from virtual environments to enrollments in schools, back to virtual environments to choosing another school um, for present on-site, off-site, trying to calculate attendance in these schools. Um, it's been busy. Uh, I don't know how many challenges you face in your district, but um, they got to be similar to these. Uh, we were at least part part successful where we instituted Scribbles and we partnered with them this year to do electronic enrollments. And we also use them for school choice. Uh, we're moving over to an electronic forms platform with them eventually so that parents can fill out the form one time for all the students that return. Um, so we've, we've, we've really uh, closed our ranks and consolidated some of our information to a Scribbles platform. Um, I also want to talk to you about Chromebooks and hotspots. I know many of you across the state are getting hotspots and using those for student connectivity, and that is such a vital item in the districts. Um, we, this, this, just over the last three weeks, distributed 10,250 Chromebooks to our grade three through five students, replacing seven and eight year old devices. Um, with those new devices, they also needed connectivity. So our district now are, is managing about 10,000 hotspots across the district, and there's still a need for more. And as our students progress away, and you never know when we'll be shut down and move to another remote environment. And if we are, we wanna prepare our students for success and make sure they have that connectivity along the way. Um, and then I also wanna talk about security. Uh, with everyone connecting and your staff coming in from, from home environments, um, from uh, public places and Wi-Fi, your students coming in, um, there needs to be a heightened awareness of security. We've noticed an increase in uh, cyber activity and um, attempts to get into uh, school districts, uh, meeting with the local Charlotte um, FBI agencies. They informed us that, that K-12 is the number one target now and there has been over 6,000 breaches this last year into K-12 environment. So you're always looking at that heightened awareness and always keeping up with it. So I encourage all of our school districts out there to keep up that governance process, keep uh, building those firewalls, keep putting those virtual private networks out there and ensure that your patches and server upgrades are there to protect our staff, our students and resources. Um, I don't wanna take up too much time because I know you're on a tight schedule today, but I just want to thank you for what you've done. Um, I hope you have a happy holidays and a great Christmas. And I want to end it with our uh, famous Michael Jordan quote of some want it to happen, some wish it could happen, and others make it happen. And you as a home-based team across the state are making it happen. You're working hard every day. You're helping our students, our staff, and our communities be successful. You've also converted over to remote learning with, without even a hitch in it. Um, everybody's done a great job. So I just want to quote what Michael Jordan said that you are making it happen and it's hats off and thank you to what you're doing out there. Uh, we'll continue to represent you on the Home Base Advisory Board. If you have any issues or concerns, you can send them to us and we'll bring them to the panel. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you, Jay, and thank you for the work you do on Home Base Advisory Board. 
All right, um, for the power school updates, here's what we're going to review this morning. Um, some state compliance reporting updates. We're going to talk about um, scheduling for not only next semester, but next year. Um, I'm hoping that can be a discussion. I'm gonna, we're going to try allowing you guys to raise your hand and, and ask questions and share. Um, share what your, your district may be doing. Um, hopefully that'll work out. We've got uh, new status alerts that I'm going to discuss, and then we're going to roll into talking about the upgrade, the minor upgrade that's coming up, and then our plans to upgrade to the 20.4 version later on next year. Um, and then, of course, we're going to go over student contacts, and with that, we're going to be discussing some new relationship types that are going to So we'll get started with state compliance. Um, everybody should know that this report, the legislative class size report for fall is due November 30th. We meet with power school daily. There are a few tickets hanging out there that we're reviewing, but so far I've said this several times this year. I feel like we're in the best place ever as far as legislative class size report. The one thing I want to share with everybody is that we do know that there's missing FTEs on the class size report itself. And that's not a big deal, and I don't want anybody not submitting or proving their reports because of those missing FTEs. Um, the main thing we're concerned with is capturing the the class averages. Um, so go ahead and submit regardless of the FTEs. We're going to look into that and hopefully have that resolved by next year. But what we found was the the finance file that we submitted to PowerSchool had missing FTEs. So we had teachers with 0.0, .0 FTEs, and we're trying to figure out why that would happen. I'm not sure if that's part time people, uh, short term subs, long term subs, whatever, but we're going to figure that out. So just remember, please share with your superintendents that the affidavits are due. Along with any waiver requests and your approval within the CIS on November 30th. We are going to make a couple of changes to the legislative class size report. I think we're always going to continue tweaking it to to make it easier on you guys. And so one of the items that we're looking at adding is a new column to display expressions, um, basically to help you because power school is seeing a lot of tickets come in where we're, we're noticing that it's your numbers aren't accurate because you've got teachers teaching separate sections at the same time during the same expression. So we're gonna add a column so that you can easily see as you review these reports, you can see if you've got teachers teaching two different sections during the same bucket of time. So that'll help you guys um, hopefully reduce the number of tickets also that's coming through to power school. Um, another thing I want to discuss with you is something we're just now having discussions with power school about, and that's giving you a monthly preview report. So it's basically going to be the legislative class size report that you're working on right now, but you'll have a version every single month with an updated uh, finance file with all the new staff throughout the month. And basically, the reason we're doing this is because legislation does say that at any point throughout the year, if um, your class sizes change and you, you are to submit the waiver request. And so it's a lot of work on you guys to try to constantly stay on top of those numbers. So we're going to put this in there monthly report in there so that you have something to run to see if you're over in any class so that you don't have to keep it separate. I know a lot of districts are working on this outside of power school, keeping numbers, but we don't want you to have to do that. So I don't want you to think this is another task for you. I'm hoping you see this as a, a tool to assist. Um, the, the two reports that we collect currently will still be the only ones that we submit to the superintendent's office. Um, but the others are just there to assist you guys. Can, can you mention one more thing with that, Justin? Um, on, on the monthly part, when do you anticipate that being pulled? Oh yeah, exactly. good question. Um, I've got to work on the timing of when these reports, when the report windows will open and close. Um, one thing to keep in mind is I don't have access to the state finance file until about the 8th or 10th, somewhere in there of every month. So it's submitted, like everybody gets paid at the end of the month, but it takes a little over access to the file to send to power school. 
So it'll probably be a window that opens mid month and closes at the end of the month. Yeah, thanks for asking that. And I'm going to keep rolling and I should have stated this up front. Um, if you have questions, we are going to take them back. We may not be able to answer all the questions just because we're on a tight schedule today, but they will get answered. We'll send out a Q and a on Friday along with the recording of this. Um, this is a slide I just pulled from our last meetup. It's just a reminder of the numbers we're looking at currently. So everybody should know this by now. Okay, infield, out of field. Um, I don't think this slide is completely accurate because we had changes as of yesterday. Yeah. Um, so this report's been in production for probably two years now, and we've not collected it yet, and we're not going to collect it again this year. Don't get me wrong when I say we're not going to collect it. I mean, we're not going to take the power school version of the report. We are um, pulling this information. Uh, we've got a team at DPI that's that's pulling it out of um, the SIS, not through the submission of the report. So um, this is something we have to report to the feds in January. So we're going to do just as we did last year, pull it the same way, put it together and submit it. Um, but I put the known issues here so that you, for those who wonder why in the heck it's in there and it hasn't been working, here's, here's why. Um, there's crosswalk mapping that's not up to date. The staff file that I'm speaking of, like the file I'm talking about is going to be used for legislative class size and infield out of field. And so we're working on getting a process in place to where that file will be automated. It'll be sent every month once it becomes available. Well, in range of the sections that contain mixed grade students. We're working on some logic changes there. So those are the things we're working on. That's what needs to be done before the report can actually be um, used in power school. But again, we're not going to collect it from the SIS this year. Um, right at the bottom, I put that we're working to hide the report, but as of yesterday, instead of hiding it, I think we may look at changing the dates or changing the description of the, the name of the report, something like, you know, do not run. I don't know what exactly we're going to do there, but once I know, I'll let you know. But just know you can ignore this report this year. All right, here's where I want to spend five or 10 minutes. Scheduling for COVID-19 for semester two and for next school year. We, we've seen quite a bit here where as students are turning to remote or coming back to school face to face, you're you're facing some challenges because of the way scheduling was done up front. And I think um, after the fact, folks realize that maybe we should have listened to DPI when we gave the advice earlier on. If you continue to schedule as if your students were there face to face in the classrooms so that you're not facing issues once things change later on. Um, legislative class size is another one you need to be cautious of because the expectations are not going to change there. So as you're scheduling, keep in mind, we still got to um, pay attention to the class max. And then the impact that changes have on gradebook and attendance records. Rob, I don't know if you want to discuss more there, but we have seen issues where when, when people go to move schedules around, these are areas where we have problems. Yeah, I, I, I don't know that I have anything to add. I, I think you, you you said quite a bit there. I, I think the, the big thing is just remember that kind of as you're scheduling that that when you're scheduling things that if you drop 50, 50 kids in a section, which are some things we've heard. And I understand that that the difficulty with this is you've got to track who's online, who's face to face. Kids are coming and going all the time. I, I understand those challenges. I think where we have started to see some things is folks had realized, which we're all going through, you know, this is a new situation for everybody. So everybody did kind of what was best. And then sometimes the scheduling ended up being completely way off. And then when kids started really coming back, that it caused some major changes that had to happen to schedules. And then there was an impact on the grades, impact on the attendance, and you're dropping kids a lot. 
And that's why we just wanted to let you know, just please remember that as you're scheduling, you, you really want to try to keep it as close, even if it's you've got, you kind of mirror your schedule and say, here's a section for, um, here's a section for face-to-face, -face, here's a section for online, and you're just bouncing kids back and forth between those sections. Um, it may be a little bit better than dropping 50 kids in one section because it's online. So we just wanted to put that out there to you to say, just remember, be careful with your scheduling and just make sure that you're doing, doing what you think is best for if all these kids end up coming back. Um, and then I do agree with that last thing that Justin's got on there and what assistance do you need? Please let us know what, what assistance you need because we, we wanna do our best to help you um, and, and try to, especially if you are hearing from others in your district that they want to do some um, innovative scheduling, let's call it that. If you want to do some innovative scheduling that, that just doesn't make sense in the CIS world, please reach out to us and we're happy to kind of work with you and with your district as you go through those discussions because we want to make sure that what you're doing works for everybody that, that's in the district. Um, and I think that's about all I've got. I don't know, Justin, if we want to let uh, some folks come off and, and say some things or if we think that's good or see what questions develop in the chat. Um, but, but I think that's good. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Do we have any questions or want to share anything that you're doing in your district that you think others might? want to hear about. And I can't see the hands, Tessa, so you'll have to let me know. Um, no, we don't really have any comments. Um, we do have one from Jackie. She said, can't you have your same schedule and some students are remote in that particular course? I would think that would be easier. Say that again. Um, can't you have your same schedule and some students are remote in that particular course? I would think that would be easier. Uh, I think that that's basically what Rob was covering when he said it's better when you're just transferring them back and forth between sections of the same course, but one's remote and one's not. I think she might have been commenting on that. I got you. She said yes. <laughs> All right, I'm going to move on because we've got about five minutes. Um, so here's a good one. Major event status alerts. This is something that we've been working on for a while and then we kind of paused and came back to it recently. Um, there is going to be alerts that go out to notify you of major events such as uh, system outages, widespread known issues, um, announcements that either DPI and or power school think are urgent enough for the whole state to to receive. And there's two ways there you're going to get it. Uh, one is an email and we are reviewing the email list now. It's the list of technical contacts. So that's the list we're going to start from. If you're a technical contact, we're going to add you to the major event status alert email uh, group. And it's it's pretty, pretty good. We've received a couple. We've got a group at DPI who's been on this, and I think you'll find it helpful. And then also we're working to add an icon to the IEM dashboard so that at any time you can go in there and click on that icon to see what alerts, like previous alerts, current alerts. So know that's coming. Rob, how soon is that going to roll out? Uh, that, that should come, the email should come pretty quickly once we get them the list. And the IM dashboard may take just a little bit more time, but the emails you should start getting pretty quickly. And these, these emails are very good. What they will tell you is if there is kind of an outage statewide, so that if you're, it, maybe your neighboring district isn't very fast sending you things at the moment when normally they are. What you could do is check and see if you have an email that says that that district next to you is down. I think that this will be very beneficial in, in helping you kind of understand the state of power school across North Carolina uh, and what's going on with it. And if it, 
a, a good example is the dropout when we had the, the, the emergency window this weekend. We received an email alert that said the dropout date reverted back and then we received another email that said the dropout date was fixed. And those are communications that now you'll start to get uh, once we update that list. So we think this will be very beneficial to you. I, I think that there's one thing we can never do too much of is is over communicate. And I think this is just one step to helping you guys stay informed with what's going on. Thank you. All right, contact relationship types real quick. This is coming soon. Um, we've had a lot of requests from you guys to extend that list, expand that list, and, and that's what we're gonna do. Um, we've went through and we've pulled what's being used now. We've got a list of what's been requested. And then you guys know we hid the code sets piece within the SIS. Um, but what we found was a lot of folks, especially those who have management companies controlling their um, environment, we found that a lot of folks have added their own. So that's the challenging piece right now for everybody that's added their own. Um, we've got this worked out to where I'll be able to push it down from the enterprise controller. But before I push anything down, I've got to get all the districts who've created their own to align uh, to align their relationship types with what I'm going to push, just so there's no duplication or any errors there when we do push that out. So know that as soon as we clean that up, we're going to go ahead and push out a list of new relationship types. Um, Justin, can you do me a favor? Yep. For anyone who doesn't, there might be some people on this call who don't know what a relationship type is. Can you explain that? Sure, with the new, um, well, not really with the new contacts, but you've got the mother, father, um, so that you can identify the, the relationship type of individual you're entering as a contact for a student. So, example, we've had a lot of requests for stepfather and stepmother, babysitter, um, stuff like that. So hopefully my goal is to have that pushed out this month so that you can start using those before we cut over in January to the contacts. And that rolls me into the student contacts piece. Um, again, we mentioned earlier, we're gonna cut over in January of 2020. I don't have a date yet, but it is gonna be in January sometime. And Lorenzo's with us today, and he's gonna cover some of this a little later on after our next presentation. But We've been telling you guys the pieces that we need before that cutover can happen. Um, and he's here to talk to you today about the Tim's extract and the student auto dialer change. So that's something that you guys will be able to do. No work from PowerSchool, no work from DPI. Um, and then the ECATS piece is currently in the works. And those were the only three pieces that we needed to update on our end before we cut over. Um, third party reminders, I put this in there because I, I really need you all to start communicating with your vendors. Anybody that's pulling your contacts right now, whether it be Blackboard, School Messenger, not School Messenger, yeah, School Messenger, um, whatever you're using, go ahead and get with them now and make sure they're prepared to pull your contacts um, from the new table once we cut over. And the last bullet point there, contacts transfer. We get hit up constantly by districts and we realize the frustration. We understand that you, you don't like the contacts transferring with the student. Um, we've been told, and we're going to get there as quick as we can, that the automation is scheduled to end when we upgrade to 20.4. 20 so there's nothing we can do for the time being. I'm sorry. And Rob was saying earlier, a lot of people are clapping in the background, and I'm sure there's a lot of people booing right now. But <laughs> we can't we can't do that until we upgrade to 20.4. And so after the next presentation, we're going to circle back around to Lorenzo and go over the the Tim's extract build and the student auto dialer build. All right, we are right on schedule. Power school upgrade. We shared earlier that we will um, will be upgrading to 1911.32 on the during the December maintenance period, and so these release notes are pretty fresh. We got them. Monday, I believe. So I dropped a link there to the release notes so that you can review those. There's really no major changes to the to the interface. So I didn't 
I didn't really have anything I can share as far as screenshots for that release. Um, but this is a release that we want to go to for security purposes. And I want to add that Russell's back. Rob introduced him earlier, but Russell uh, helped us with the last upgrade. And then he, we brought him back to help with the this upgrade, the next upgrade, and cross LEA. So we're definitely glad to have him back. And with that said, I've dropped the 20.4 release notes there for you to review. And we have Victor from Power School who's joined us um, to kind of show you what's coming out in 20.4. And Rob, what I'd like to do after after the coordinators see what's coming in 20.4, I think it'd be good maybe Friday when we release this to put out a survey um, to kind of kind of find out how quick we may want to upgrade to this version because there's a lot of neat things that's coming with this release. Uh, I think that's a good idea. And then we can put all the uh, puzzle pieces in place. That's good. Thank you. So can you get Victor control? Victor, are we are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. And, and Justin, I was just going to throw out. I was sorry. Um, good morning, everybody. This is Alex Andrews. Um, as Victor gets things uh, set up here, I uh, just wanted to throw out there's we're going to be covering quite a bit of highlights here from 20.4. Um, as Justin uh, mentioned already, uh, there there is a, there are a lot of new features here that uh, we're pretty excited about. We figure uh, North Carolina will be excited about these as well. So. Um, again, we're going to be showing a lot. So if there are questions, as I anticipate there will be, um, you can feel free to shoot those my way or, or just if you're going to be collecting questions, you know, it might be easier to, to answer those after the fact, maybe in one big consolidated document. Um, just because, again, since we're going to be covering so much, uh, I'm not sure if we'll have time for really a live Q&A uh, from the power school side. So uh, just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, I think I think the best thing to do there, Alex, is if you guys just keep please putting your questions in the chat, we will grab the chat and we will make sure we get answers to your questions. Excellent. Victor, are you able to share? My share button seems to be grayed out. Don't know why. Okay, just came on board. So you all should see my PowerSchool 20.4 feature review slide. Let me know if that's the case. Yep, well, we can see it. Okay, perfect. And uh, like Alex mentioned, there's uh, quite a bit of new things uh, as part of the 20.4 release. And first, uh, Becky, one step, uh, pleased to meet all of you. I think this is the first time that I speak to most, if not all of you, for sure, this group. Uh, my name is Victor Quadra. I've been with Power School since uh, 2001, so a longtime uh, employee from the company. And, uh, and I'm here in Arizona today, uh, hoping to show you things about Power School 20.4. First, if, if, uh, if you hadn't discussed it or caught on, the 20.4, basically what you'll see from now on since last year is our releases will be labeled for, with a year. That's the 20 part of it, 2020, and four would be the month. So you'll know roughly the age of the release that you have by looking at those two numbers. So 20.4 is April of 2020. And it did bring uh, a number of new functionality and features uh, across the board, and we'll again give you here the highlights of what is coming. Uh, and the first one will be a new experience. This is a, an optional new experience for your users uh, in the administrative and teacher sides of things that will look like this. You'll have a, a quick data item uh, or list of uh, widgets here on the left-hand side with uh, address students and your percentage of attendance for the day. Uh, you'll see that there are uh, quite a few things uh, that are a little bit different, uh, like uh, the student uh, search. Now you'll have a drop down instead of having the tabs where you can select, you know, students, uh, teachers or staff, uh, and then uh, contacts uh, to work with the with the contacts, uh, the new contact uh, uh, functionality. And when you click on the drop down next to it, that new uh, direct field search, you're going to be able to select 
you know, the main things that people look for when you're looking for students. So grade level, gender, date of birth, things of that nature. So you can select it from the list and then without having to type in, you know, grade underscore level equals 12, you can just put in the number 12 and find uh, the kids that you're looking for. The other difference that we'll see is that then you're going to be able to run several searches one after the other, uh, and then the system will append them together. So there'll be ands. In this case, we're looking for grades level 10 or 12, first name you know, starts with JA, and the gender is male, and then the resulting kids will be there at the bottom. Uh, and then you'll be able to uh, you know, click on the Xs basically by any of those terms to remove that and expand your search for a little wider net or continue typing other things on the search box to narrow your search. And then you, it's much easier for your front end staff, I think, to just type in things and continue to narrow down the list of kids that they're looking for uh, through this interface. So it takes a little bit of getting used to, but it is again, much, much better and much easier to use in the, in the, uh, in the end. Then uh, if you are looking for individual kids, like putting in their, you know, their last name and so forth, you'll see the kids that show up on the on the drop down on the smart search will be able to be added in the individually through that plus sign to the overall search. So if you look for all of your football team, you realize one of the kids isn't there. You can then uh, type in the name of a student, click on the plus sign, and they'll be added to that particular uh, group or selection that you have in that moment. So again, uh, easier to use. You'll also have a minus sign if there's a student that's there that comes up in the second search uh, and you wanna remove them from the current selection. So again, uh, ways to, to easily uh, find and work with students is the, is the main uh, function of that uh, overhaul of that uh, user interface uh, in the administrative side. From the teacher side, if you guys are using the new CTE or the, you know, the career tech uh, tracking that we added in, in the 19.11 version, we've added uh, an option for teachers to be able to display the CTE courses that the students are taking uh, right from the uh, Power Teacher interface. So clicking on the backpack, going on to the, uh, the, the student page, and then they'll have career tech as one of their options. Uh, another one uh, of those items that are uh, revamped from the user interface as well is the system report. Uh, we've created a system report security page so that then for all of your security groups there on the very top, you'll see examples and you'll have all of the reports that show up, the built-in reports. Those are the built-in PowerSchool reports under the system tab. You'll have the ability to turn on or off the functionality, but then turn any one of those individual reports on or off for any of your groups. So that'll uh, help all of you with security, making sure that the right people have access to the right reports uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, again, usability examples. And then uh, attendance admission slips uh, from the teacher attendance dashboard. You'll have also, uh, I'm not sorry, not the teacher, the administrative attendance dashboard. When you are changing attendance for an individual student from that uh, pop-up window on the far right, you will have a checkbox that'll allow your staff to uh, print uh, automatically an attendance slip uh, right from that attendance screen. So again, the attendance dashboard, you go to daily or the meeting attendance from that attendance dashboard in the office, uh, mode and the administrative mode, uh, edit a attendance uh, for an individual kid, you'll have the the uh, the ability to print an attendance dashboard. It will bring up uh, a, uh, a pop-up window with a print button with the attendance slip just as you see it there. So if your staff marks a kid tardy, you know, late, absent for half the day and then present, uh, whatever attendance code for the day that the student have will be displayed there on the bottom side of that attendance slip. Uh, so we continue to improve that workflow for attendance for your front office staff. Now, uh, a major area of improvement here for data security, and I think all of you will, will uh, appreciate this, uh, is the ability to have a front-facing 
uh, area for attendance uh, changes. And this is like an audit trail for a, a large section of the PowerSchool student data uh, fields and pages and tables. So what you will see then is in, in uh, many of our pages now, you'll have a, an option on the upper right that says view historical changes, and you'll see a complete audit trail from who did the change using what IP address, what uh, action they took, and then the before and after values from the changes. So how does it work? Uh, we record all of the changes to the data in select fields and select screens or sets of data, and we track uh, these fields. Like I mentioned, is basically what you need for an audit trail. The time and date, who did the change, the IP address, what kind of change, adding, updating, deleting, and the before and after values for anything that was changed for that particular data set. So what does it track? Uh, it tracks any changes, no matter the source. So it could be an administrative user and the, and the admin portal, any of your of the APIs, like we mentioned school messenger or uh, special education program or whatever third party system that uses our API, those changes will be tracked and reported as well, uh, as well as any system process, mass data tools like DDE or DDA or uh, mass changing field values, uh, anything coming from any of the public portals, uh, and even, uh, of course, anything that we change from Power School support side of things will be logged there as well. So then the third question is, what does it track? Uh, there are currently 23 uh, tables uh, that we keep track of history for in 20.4. Uh, and this is a list that will very, very likely be enhancing on future versions. Uh, we want to make sure that we're mindful of database sizes, uh, and that we know how this uh, is working for all of you. So the major things, attendance, career tech setup, class enrollments, contacts, demographics, uh, the health screens, which, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, including you know incidents and uh, for discipline, medication monitoring, uh, nursing, nursing logs, PE waivers. Uh, again, I won't finish reading, it's a long list, uh, which we will be expanding uh, in the future but again, the idea is uh, you'll have that change history uh, on the upper right of those respective pages that are listed on that screen. When someone clicks on that, you'll be able to see the audit track uh, for every change that is made over time for those particular fields. So um, that's pretty exciting in terms of the data security uh, thing. Was there a question or a comment? There, well, Victor, I did have one question. I've been watching the chat a little bit. I think one question has popped up that I think is a very good question. Um, with this, will it also show who put in the original entry or is this strictly just changes? I believe this is changes. So uh, I think once this is turned on and it is a feature that you can turn on or off, uh, once it's turned on, we'll start from that moment in time uh, forward with who has uh, uh, who has made any changes to data from that point on, because uh, we don't have obviously the functionality wasn't there before that, so we don't have the original who added it, the data originally. But if it is new data that is added after this functionality is on, then you will have the original creation. Like one of the actions will be add or create, or I believe we call it add which would be that that would be the original person that created the data or the interface it could be online enrollment uh, or, you know, a, an individual user and so forth. So from the point they turn it on, it will keep track of original entries from that moment forward. Correct. Yes. As well as changes. Okay, good to go. Thank you. Yeah, de definitely. Good question. Definitely a good question. So, uh, so again, that's one of the major areas, kind of in the back end for all of us that are in the SIS data business. This is this is pretty big and pretty exciting to make sure that we can revert changes and so forth with minimal effort. Uh, all right, uh, moving forward, uh, we do have an administrative dashboard for this as well. So, you as an administrator will be able to select one of the categories, put in a start and end date, and then uh, view all of the changes in math. So you don't have to navigate to, you know, Johnny's student page to see their historical demographics. You can actually have a, a, a dashboard for you as an administrator to view all of the changes that have happened in a particular date range. Uh, and then you can uh, 
use filters to narrow down changes. You know, if you're hunting for data that's been changed in a particular field for a particular student, for a particular, you know, a kind of change that you're looking for. From that dashboard, you'll also have the ability to select the students that have been changed or involved in those changes. Uh, that'll be that first button. Uh, or set them, you know, to the current selection or add them to the current selection. But also, uh, you'll be able to export the the data change history to a CSV file. So you can you can uh, export uh, whole ranges of changes of of data so that you can use them outside of PowerSchool if you if you have the need for that at any point. Uh, so let's uh, yeah. So so again, a, a lot of exciting data management tools. Now, uh, same vein, you know, as we're looking forward to next school year, we've added the ability to copy years and terms, school calendars, reporting terms, and quick look preferences, which are the major things that you have to do for every school, especially if you have multiple schools uh, in your district, in your organization, you'll have the ability now uh, with a quick dashboard to copy any one or all of those settings uh, throughout all of your schools. So you can go, you know, to a particular elementary school, set that school up and then copy those changes, the, you know, start of end years, uh, and, and all the other things, the calendars, reporting terms, and you don't have to export and import or do any of the workarounds you were doing before, or simply manually do this for every school. Now you'll be able to duplicate all of these settings across multiple schools. Uh, so again, big time changes, kind of a small, one slide uh, improvement, but it's big time save changes for a lot of your staff. Uh, this is another one in that same vein that'll help uh, improve the workflow for a lot of your folks uh, at the building level when they are working with discipline incidents. This meaning, uh, you know, uh, in, in, through incident management. And uh, they'll have the ability to tie on a, an action like a consequence for the student, a suspension, a detention, a, you know, out of school suspension uh, to a num one uh, attendance code. And you'll have an addition of an, of an attendance button uh, in the incident management uh, screens, whether it be the quick incident or the overall uh, incident. Uh, when you click on that uh, enter attendance, the system will automatically have the date ranges for that incident for the consequence. So if the student was suspended, in this case, from April 7th through April 9th, uh, when you click on that set for all range at the very top, the system will copy whatever attendance code was linked to that consequence uh, and copy that for either the day or every one of the classes. That way we shortcut a lot of the work related to attendance uh, for the folks that are managing behavior. Uh, again, the workflow would be somebody adds a child that had, you know, a fight in school and they're going to be out of school suspended for three days. As soon as they mark uh, the, you know, the, uh, the, the action as being out of school suspension, they'll have that attendance button and they can click on set all range there at the top of the attendance pop-up that comes up through discipline incident and then mass uh, set the attendance for those particular kids uh, for however many kids uh, individually, one by one, uh, for that have a consequence that includes a change in attendance for them. So uh, there's, a, again, a, a good workflow enhancements for your uh, discipline folks at the building level. And then uh, this one, uh, will be one of those that is, uh, depending if you're using uh, the help or if you can, uh, as a group, m uh, migrate to the health functionality, we have significantly enhanced uh, the health pages and the health functionality in PowerSchool. Uh, immunizations has always been there, but there's been updated for screening and office visits. Uh, we've added health plans so that you can have uh, health plans with templates that go into the student records, uh, monitoring of, uh, of, uh, of physicals, medication administrations, health concerns, all of these health concerns tied to the uh, alert notification in PowerSchool. So uh, when you turn on the new health functionality, you'll see all of these tabs here across the top. And 
Uh, one of the bigger ones is uh, a health plan. So if you do have a health plan, student has chronic uh, allergies or asthma or diabetes, you can have templates for all of these common conditions that your nursing staff can fill out and maintain right from within the SIS, print these health plans. We'll also have uh, the ability for uh, your folks uh, to, uh, or your students to have multiple health plans if they have multiple conditions and keep track of all of that through the health screen in PowerSchool. Uh, you can also view the re a receipt log to make sure that your teachers, your counselors, your staff is reviewing uh, and, and reading those particular health plans uh, right from the SIS. Uh, and uh, health concerns and health plans will be added automatically to the medical alert pay, uh, alert that comes with PowerSchool. So there's a significant uh, uh, improvements to the medical alert as well. We'll also be able to track medical tracking, and I'm running uh, short on time here. Uh, track inventory of your medications, track the daily doses and, and, and administration of medication, uh, and whether they refused, they were absent, et cetera, uh, and have a daily log of everybody that is both scheduled uh, and that have come to the office so that your uh, medical staff or your nurses can keep track of their scheduled appointments as well through the system. Uh, and then uh, some enhancements to Power Teacher Pro to again make things easier, transfer grades from older classes to new classes, uh, improvements to managing and keeping track of standards from the teacher perspective to simplify uh, the, the interface and making sure that they can both add uh, standards to their activities in the classroom, but also include or not into standards into the final grade. So again, uh, a lot of uh, enhancements in terms of the interface. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about contacts as well. Well, we added that as well to uh, uh, the contacts, the limited contacts uh, to Power Teacher Pro to give that information to the teachers. Obviously, they need often to come uh, connect with the parents. So uh, again, the ability to view that all that information and manage standards and so forth and contacts right from the teacher view. Uh, we've added also a new report which includes contacts for the teachers, so they can print out like a like an emergency sheet with all of the contacts for all of the kids in their class. Uh, we've done improvements to grade scales. Again, th this continues to move on and on. Uh, I'll go quickly here so you know what to look for. But grade scales have been adjusted so that the teachers can also, uh, if you give them option to, they can uh, adjust cut scores and adjust grade scales to the particular classes that they have in their in their in their grades. Uh, and there's some uh, summer updates for uh, that actually came in in 20.4.3. Those would be the, our summer summer release uh, that include uh, mass emailing from Power Teacher. Uh, we did some uh, importing uh, additions so that you can import a lot of the data for those health screens. Uh, and attendance tracking support. Uh, again, this is one of those eternal uh, now uh, new normal things where uh, you'll have the ability as, a, as an administrator to select kids and use tracks. Uh, one of the options that we did to help our schools was let the, the administrators set kids and use the track functionality in PowerSchool to mark kids that are online or hybrid uh, or, or whatever scenario they have. And if the teacher uses a slide uh, slider there for the track functionality, it would separate their kids by whatever tracks they have. That way they can take attendance for online kids versus in-person kids, and, and you don't have to create multiple sections for something that might be a, a unified track, uh, or this could be a kid that, you know, three kids are in quarantine at home uh, and the rest of the kids are in person. The teacher can be, uh, you can change those tracks and have the teachers see clearly who should be a present versus uh, online and so on and so forth. So a lot of good functionality uh, that as well. Uh, the group by track is only on the attendance screen. I saw one of the questions uh, scroll by, not on the grade book yet. It's something that we're considering as part of this, uh, all this uh, new, new normal, like I mentioned, uh, but at least for attendance right at this moment with 20.4, Dot three, you'll be able to see that functionality there to help your teachers manage their attendance in their class. 
So, uh, and then there'll be that email functionality. Again, something that's been uh, asked for for a long, long time uh, for your parents or your teachers, I'm sorry, to be able, able to email any of your parents, students, et cetera, including anyone that's been added to that uh, new contact functionality in 19.11 or so. So with that, I think that's the end. I think I went a few minutes late, so I apologize for throwing you back a little bit on your time, uh, but hopefully that was useful. Uh, I'll throw it back uh, to Jason, uh, or we can answer some questions or let us know how we can help. All right. Thank you, Victor. Um, there are a few questions, but since we're short on time, I think we will take those back and just I'll share those with you guys, Alex, and you can help answer them and we'll share them back out Friday. Perfect. Sounds good. So I think we'll have to give me control again. Justin, can I make one comment while you're shifting there about the survey you're sending out? Sure. Um, please remember that when we shift to different versions that it, it is not a small task. Please remember, we've got to make sure that it works with all the systems we have at DPI. We've got to get it tested to make sure it doesn't break anything when we put it out there. So um, please, when you're giving us the dates, please just be reminded that we just have a lot of work on our end to do, but um, hopefully as you've seen, we'll communicate with you, let you know the pace we're moving at, what we expect, and if that has to change, we would let you know as well. So just please keep that in mind if Justin sends the survey out. All right, so before I turn it over to Lorenzo for the rest of the, the training piece, uh, I wanna share again for those who may not have been on when we went over the student contacts piece, but there are a couple of items that you're gonna be responsible for setting up and be ready for these things to start using them in January when we do the cutover. One is the Tim's piece and the other is the student auto dialer. And Lorenzo is gonna show you where both of those are. A lot of people don't even know what we're talking about when we say the student auto dialer, but those are two items within the CS. Um, the TIMS piece is actually a customization. So this is one item I'm happy to switch away from because of course we want to get away from customizations as much as possible, but I've dropped two links here and Lorenzo, if you have other resources um, that we didn't know about, feel free to drop those in the chat or send them to me and I'll share them out. Power School site to kind of show you more about Data Export Manager. Um, some of you may not have access to do what Lorenzo is about to show you, but that that is a security setup piece. You'll have to give yourself access or get somebody to give you access to do what he's about to go over. Um, so with that, Lorenzo, I'm going to turn it over to you and Tesla. You'll have to give him access to share his. Thing. All right, all right, good deal. Thank you. And let me see if I can get the right screen shared over here. All right, good deal. I think we're I think we're set. So, so yeah, I'm going to go over um, I'm going to go over Data Export Manager. For some of you, this may be familiar. Uh, I'm I'm mostly going to be going over the uh, the contacts piece and also the the new Tim's extract. So, um, you know, as Justin was mentioning, you know, we're trying to move things away from customizations and putting things more in the core product. And, uh, you know, there's a number of reasons for that. And um, so, you know, as we get into that, uh, as as Justin mentioned, there may be some things that uh, that I'm showing here that you may not have access to right off the bat. Um, so, yeah, as he said, you'll need to, um, you know, work with whoever your data managers are or um, or whoever manages security in your um, in your district to to make sure that you have the access necessary to do that. So. Uh, you know, just kind of going off of that, uh, what I'm what I'm going to do here, because we're focusing, uh, at least here in the beginning, I'm going to be focusing on contacts. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about uh, about the core contacts piece itself and then work our way into the export feature of that. Um, so I've got two students here uh, in my in my selection. Um, it's saying I'm sharing my screen, but I guess I should probably check. You guys can see my screen OK? Yes. All right, cool. All righty, good deal. So uh, I've got two students on here. I, I did a search with just AD. So my, my two students here are AD. So I've got Brandon Adair and Corby Adams. Um, you know, also as we continue to move our way towards Data Export Manager, I guess one of the first things I want to mention is 
a lot of the things in Data Export Manager are driven based off of selections, just like your quick export is driven off of selections. Your DDE is driven off of selections. Uh, the Database Export Manager, Data Export Manager, um, also has these selection mechanisms that are built into it as well. So just keep that in mind as we go through this, especially dealing with contacts. So we're dealing with these two students right now. So we're working with Brandon and Corby. So just, just keep that in the back of your mind as I go through this. So I'm gonna go here into Brandon and I'm gonna take a look at the contacts, right? So right now you have our, our core contacts, which is the screen right here. And you also have your North Carolina contacts, which we are moving away from. So the core contacts, I've got all of these different people that are associated with my student, Brandon Adair. So I've got uh, five people. I'm gonna be working with John Adair, which I've got his name, his email address in here. I uh, was showing his father. He's got one main phone number on here. Um, it says he's got custody, a couple other things. He also has data access. So data access just means he has the ability to access Brandon's record inside of the public portal. All of these other contacts do not. Maybe they do have an access account for other students, but they do not for Brandon. The only person in this list that has access to Brandon's data from the public portal is John. That's the only person that has access to the data. I can click on actions and I can make some changes to data access to say they don't have access to student data and email, but as it currently stands, this person does. Um, some of the other things, other options that were uh, previously um, inside of the parent portal, th those are those are here as well. So you can make changes uh, to this particular person, John, for this particular student, Brandon. So you can make some of these changes to this person uh, for this student right here inside of the screen. Um, of course, I can make some changes to these flags as well. If I want to say that he lives with or he receives mail, whatever that may be, you can make those changes right inside of here. If I needed to make changes to the actual contact John, I can click on John's name here. And keeping in mind, when I click on this, I'm leaving Brandon completely and I'm now working with just John, okay? So all of the data when I click on this has really nothing to do with Brandon at this point. This is only John that I'm working with right now. So I can see his contact information for the uh, for the web account, his username, um, if there's an email address that's associated with that, which we which we recommend, and I think it's required for new uh, for new accounts. But this is important for self service for uh, email resetting and things along those lines. So um, email address would be in here as well. If I needed to add any phone numbers, if I needed to add any email addresses or mailing address, physical address. Um, uh, vacation home, whatever it may be, I can add all of that inside of here. Again, nothing to do with Brandon. This is only John that we're working with. So I can make all of these changes to this contact, John, uh, from, from this particular screen. Now you can see Brandon is linked to this particular contact, um, but changing anything on this screen really has nothing to do with Brandon except for this one line here where we have those same flags that we saw in Brandon's account, which again, I can click on Brandon's name here and it'll take me right to where I was. Uh, but I can make these changes right inside here to make some, you know, I can make some changes right here by clicking on the pencil and it'll change Brandon's data. The screen should look familiar. It's what we just saw when we were inside of Brandon's account. Again, this is John's data for Brandon, okay? Um, or, of course, I can click on Brandon's name and it'll take me again back to Brandon's account, go, but going back to the contact screen where I was, and maybe I wanted to make some changes to some of these other people that are associated to Brandon. All right. So now that we've kind of gone through that, you know, we've, we've gone through, um, you know, just kind of accessing the contacts, just kind of showing how you can make some changes to the particular contact here, paying specific attention to email address and phone number, okay? So again, I'm gonna just go inside of John one more time here. Looking at John, John has two phone numbers. He has one preferred phone number and he's got one phone number that's not his preferred number, but it will take SMS. So it, it can accept text messages. So keeping in mind, this person has two phone numbers and this person also has one email address that I entered here. So, I'm gonna go through uh, how we use Data Export Manager and how we can export some of this data. 
Um, but keep in mind that there are two phone numbers for this person and that there's one email address for this person as well. Okay, so to get into the data export manager, let me go ahead and go back to the start page. Uh, you access the data export manager a very similar way that you would access uh, direct database export or you would access quick export. Um, and that's through the, uh, the special functions menu over here on the left. And again, before I click on this, remember, I have two students selected, Brandon and Corby. So here in special functions, importing and exporting. So about halfway down the screen, importing and exporting. And data export manager. So again, that's special functions, importing and exporting, and data export manager. More than likely, you all have access to the link to get here, but you will be able to see all of these categories. When you click on them, you may or may not see, I'm going to go ahead and go to PowerSchool datasets. You may or may not see a drop down menu that appears here. If you don't have anything in this second drop down menu, that means that you don't have the permissions necessary to extract data out of the system. So you want to make sure that, uh, you know, if you don't have anything in that second drop down, make sure that you work with your coordinator or whoever is responsible. Maybe it's you. Maybe you don't have the permissions to set that up. Work with them to give yourself that uh, that level of access. Now, I won't show you guys how to do that here on this uh, here, here on this, but if if any of you do have that responsibility for maintaining security, I would say um, you know open up a PowerSchool ticket, work with uh, work with EPI, whatever whatever means that uh, that you take to uh, to receive help and support, um, work with them, and we'll work with you to make sure that you have the ability to access um, the data that you need to be able to extract. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go into tables. And I want to just start something very simple here. I'm going to start with simple and then I'm going to work my way into contacts. So if I wanted to extract some student data, I would be able to extract students and I can say, all right, well, I want to extract their ID. Maybe I want to pull out their, um, you know, their name. So here's last first. Uh, maybe I want to find their student number. So I can go down here, find student number. So maybe I just want to make a real simple extract. So I can change the label on the extract. So maybe I want this to say student ID. Maybe this is going to be student name. And then I've got student number. So this would be their UID, for instance. So maybe I wanted to label these this way. I have these three items. These are how they're going to be labeled on the export. It's going to be the headers. And I'll click next. Now, remember I said that the data export manager works based off a of selection. So I have students to include. Well, I can use my current selection of two students. I've got Brandon and Corby in there. If I didn't have a selection, it would try and export every student inside of this school. I'm in Apple Grove High School. All right. I could choose some filters. I can filter based off of the columns that I have in my uh, in my selection to export. So again, I chose ID, last first, student number. If I wanted to do a search based off of last first, I could do this. I could filter it even deeper. Maybe I just want a dare. That would only pull one student because there's there's two students in my selection and one of them has the last name of a dare. So that would only pull out one student. Just an example of how that works. I'll go ahead and leave it the way it is. I can click on show records in here, which this is really pretty interesting. Uh, there's two main functions that you can do inside of Data Export Manager. Uh, you can, of course, extract data. And a little contrary to the name Data Export Manager, you can actually manage some of the data that's in here as well. Um, I won't be able to do it here on the, uh, on the students themselves, but I can actually, um, if I have that, uh, that security assigned to me, I can actually make changes to some of this data. So if I was doing something inside of, um, you know, one of my tables where I'm, I'm trying to make a change to a certain, uh, certain column, in some cases, not all, but in some cases, I may actually be able to make changes to some of that data as well inside of here. Um, there are some rare cases where you may want to do that. I would say, generally speaking, you want to use the user interface to make changes to data, but Again, there are some cases where you where you need to inside of database extensions, for example, you would be able to uh, to make some changes to that data in here as well. Uh, nonetheless, this show records button that I just clicked on, this is kind of kind of give me a preview of the data that's going to be included in my extract. 
you're not going to have this show records button for everything, but uh, for basic extracts, that's a keyword there, for basic extracts, you will have that button. Like I'm doing a basic extract out of the student's table, very similar to a quick export. Um, so you, you have that button where you can actually see what the data is going to look like. So this is what my extract looks like. If I say filter by last first equals a dare, uh, actually last first contains a dare because it would be a dare comma Brandon for the, for the entire last first. I click on show records there. Well, now I just have Brandon, right? Just like I said, there's two students, but only one of them has a dare inside of the name. Therefore, it limits it to just one instead of the two that I previously had. Get back to my two records here. And from here, I can click on next. And I've got some options for exporting. Again, very similar to some of the other export features. Um, it's showing that I have two records that are going to be extracted. And I have the ability to choose a file name. I have an ability to put in the line delimiter, field delimiter. Most times you can leave these the way that they are. Sometimes you have to have a comma delimited. You can do that. Sometimes maybe you, you have something else. Maybe you want to do a, a delimiting based on a pound sign. You know, whatever, whatever that may be, you have that control to do that. I'm going to leave it as tab delimited. Um, character set, you know, the default here is Windows ANSI, but of course there's UTF-8, Mac Roman, and ISO 8859. Windows ANSI seems to work well for most, ex, uh, for most extracts, for most applications. Um, generally speaking inside of here, you know, really the only things that you may want to make a change to are the file name and the way that the fields are delimited. Um, Otherwise, you know, carriage return, maybe you have to do carriage return line feed or just line feed, whatever application is consuming the file will probably give you specific instructions on how to set that. Um, otherwise, you'll pretty much want to just leave it the way that it is. So if you have specific instructions to say to do it a certain way, you can, of course, make those changes. But generally, um, these settings are, are pretty well. Um, and so I would, I would say that those are probably the best. Um, yeah, so file name, we'll leave it as students export. As far as the options go, you've got include column headers, and then of course you can surround field values and quotes. Surround field values and quotes is best suited for a comma delimited extract. Comma delimited extracts, uh, surrounding field values and quotes is pretty industry standard for a comma delimited, uh, comma separated values or CSV file. Um, so, you know, if you, if you do have a comma delimited, you may want to surround field values in quotes because that, uh, generally speaking, is a standard for comma-separated value files. Um, we're going to keep it on tab, and so therefore we don't care so much about this. Uh, you may have cases where your data does have tabs inside of it. It's not as common, but we've seen it before, um, in which case maybe you do want to checkmark that box. or Maybe you don't want a tab-delimited file. Um, so in, in that case, you know, you may want to do a, a comma separated value set up appropriately surrounding the field values in quotes that will um, kind of fix the issue about the uh, about the tabs. So there's always ways around that as long as the consuming application can support it. Okay, so from here, I've got two things that I can do. I can either just go ahead and click on this export button, or if this is something that I'm going to be doing yeah, often, maybe once a week, maybe once a month. I mean, even if you do it three or four times a year, this still could be a time saver. I can save this as a template, right? So if I want to save this as a template, I'll just click on that button, give it a name, and then it already has my extract already, uh, already populated. So this is gonna be my student's extract. So I can save this as a new template, and then I now have that available for uh, for my myself to uh, to do the extract inside of my templates. So it saves a lot of the work, so you don't have to do it again in the future. But when I'm done, I'll just click on this little export button down here, and then it downloads the file. Happened pretty quick, but I'm only downloading two students. All right. And again, I could open that up in Excel and, and analyze that if I'd like. It's a simple tab delimited file. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it a little more complicated because we want to deal with more complex data. So I'm going to go ahead and refresh this screen. So I'm going to reload my data export manager. I'm going to start, start from scratch again here. And I want to do an extract based on student contacts. I want to export contact data. Now contacts, as we mentioned before, 
are associated to students. So that's that's important because remember, Data Export Manager is based off of selections and contacts are related to students. Therefore, I will be able to use my student selection when I'm doing my contacts export. So that's uh, that that that's key. That's key. Unless, of course, you want to export all of your contacts, you don't have to worry about that selection. We'll talk about that here in just a minute. So as far as the category goes, I'm going to go into PowerSchool data sets because this is a very special set of data that uh, that we're extracting. It's, um, you know, the contact tables, if you can imagine, you have a contact and then you have all of these addresses that are associated to all of these different contacts. And you have all these different email addresses that are associated to all these contacts. Same thing with phone numbers. So one contact can have many student associations. One contact can have many phone numbers, can have many email addresses, can have many mailing addresses. So therefore, the database structure of all of this is very complicated. And it's actually more complicated than I probably just made it sound. Um, I won't get into all the details there, but what I can say is PowerSchool did build something so that you don't have to do too much work. Now, what PowerSchool has provided, it, you know, we found that it fulfills most of the needs that are out there. You always have the ability to be able to, um, you know, to create your own extracts by way of how we're doing the TIMS extract, which again, going one step deeper there, when we go into TIMS, just know that we had to build a special extract for TIMS because that's a very special extract. Um, so if you have a special need for contacts, you have the ability to do that as well. So for right now, we're, we're going to talk about the PowerSchool data sets. There's a lot of options in here for career tech, for code sets, grade config, health data, standards, student data as well, transportation. Um, but we're going to focus on contacts. What we have done here, we have already built the query that links all of this stuff together. Okay, so from here, I can say, all right, well, maybe I want to pull the contact ID. Remember, this is the contact name, first and last name, not the students, the contact first and last name. Maybe I want to know where they're employed. I want to know if they're active or not. And let's go ahead and just go down through here. And I've got um, access account email address. If they have an access account, I want to be able to see their email address and an access account just for the record. An access account is what gives this person the ability to sign into the public portal. So if I wanted to have the access account email address, I could pull that into this as well. As you can see, this comes from a different table. This comes from a table called PCAS email contact, right? You didn't need to know that by using this. You would just know, okay, well, I want the access account email address. Um, maybe I want their actual email address, which may be different from the email address that they use for access accounts. I don't know about you guys, but I have more than one email address. I have an email address that I use for one thing, and I have an email address I use for another. I have an email address for home. I have, I have an email address for work. I use my home email. I have, sorry, excuse me. I use my home email address to sign into all of my accounts, but I prefer my communication to go into my work email address because I'm always working inside of my work email address, and I'll check my home email address. I don't know, maybe once a week, twice a week. So if there's something important that comes to me, I want it to come to my work email. I don't want it to go to my home email, but I'm not going to use my work email to sign up for our, for accounts. So that's you know a, a good example of why you may want to have both of these in this extract. Lots of other things in here as well. Um, in, in addition to the email address, there's an email address association um, email type. Is it their primary email address? Do I want to know if this email address is their primary email address? Yeah, I do want to know that. Uh, their phone number. I want to get the phone number. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, get a phone number as entered. Here's the phone number. Uh, do I want to know if it is their preferred phone number? Yeah, I do want to know. Do I want to know if it'll take an SMS? Sure. If I want to know their address, I could pull that in here as well. Maybe I don't care so much about address. Maybe I just care about email and phone numbers for right now. But all these options are here. You can add them. No problem at all. Um, let's see here. So now student contact association. This is what links students with contacts. It is the student to the contact association table. So yeah, I want to know the student, the student's last name, the student's first name. I want to know that. I want to know if it allows data access. So we know that we already pulled in here access account email address. 
that's saying whether or not they have an access account, but it doesn't say whether or not they have data access to this particular student. So you can put that in here as well. So, and of course there's relationship, custody, all those check marks, all those check boxes that we were looking at previously. Um, those are all in here as well. Okay, so I've made a lot of options here, you know, stuff that's related to the person or the contact, their access account email address, their, their communicating email address, what email address they wanna use for communication, asking if it's their primary email address, I get their phone numbers, is their phone number an SMS? Remember, the, the student, or sorry, not the student, the contact we were looking at, which was John Adair, had two phone numbers associated with it. So we're going to expect there to be two lines um, for this. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you that here in a minute. But again, it also shows you the students that are associated to the contact. So I'll click on next. And you can see here, students to include. Well, now why do I have students to include when I'm working with contacts? Well, if you only want contacts that are related to these two students, and I guess related is a poor choice of words, contacts that are linked to these two students, you can do that very easily right here. I want to export all of these contacts, but I only want contacts that are associated with these two students. I just keep this box checked. I only get contacts that are associated to these two students and nobody else. If I wanted to, I could uncheck this and I would get all of the contacts. That's a lot. Um, if I want that, you know, I, maybe I do want all of my contacts, but I, maybe I want to make sure that they're all active because you can have inactive contacts inside of your system. Uh, so we want to make sure that, you know, we set these things appropriately. I'm going to do just these two students. I'm going to do all of the contacts, even contacts that may be inactive. And uh, I also have the ability to extract um, contacts that are related to these two students that are both active and inactive that have no access account, or maybe they do have an access account or has an active access account or an inactive access account. So these are account access to the public portal. Um, throughout time, I would imagine these filters are probably going to be built on. Some of the other, um, some of the other areas to export have more filters that are already associated to them. I believe incident management is one that has a lot of additional options. And I would expect that through time, this is probably going to increase. And you know, as always, if there's any suggestions for improvement, we have our enhancement request system, um, which actually does get utilized, contrary to popular belief, that does get utilized. A lot of the new features that are being put into the SIS are some of the most popular features inside of the enhancement request system. So I'll just kind of throw that out there as well. So I'm doing uh, my two students, contacts related to these two students, all of the contacts related to these two students, and uh, you know, I don't really care so much about the access account, so I'm just gonna say, go ahead and pull everything. I'll click on next. Same options that I had before. It's, so it's showing me I have 10 records that I'm going to have extracted. So 10 records, that means 10 contacts are going to be extracted, part of my extract. And uh, I'm gonna have my file name. I'm just gonna be contacts export. I can change that file name uh, however I want. Uh, it's gonna be carriage return, tab delimited. We talked about all of this, leaving it all the way that it is. I'm going to include my column headers. Maybe you don't, you know, it depends on whatever your needs are. And I'm gonna go ahead and leave the field values in quotes unchecked. And then I'll click on my export. So I've got my contacts export. I'm gonna open this up inside of Excel so we can kind of take a look at this. So let me see if I can do this quickly and easily over here. Pull this right there. All right, so now I've got my contacts export. And remember, it said there were 10 records, but I've got 17 rows of data. Um, some of them, this one, as you can see, doesn't have a name associated to it. Um, this is probably the email address, and this one likely is um, a phone number that didn't have a name associated to it. Uh, but most of these do have names. So I see Jason, John, Sally, Wilma, Jacob, Lori, Donovan, Donovan, and Jonathan, so that's eight. And then I've got these two outliers, so that equals 10. So that's my 10 rows, 10, uh, 10 contacts, but we were looking at John. So let's take a look at John here. So I've got two records for John. John is associated to Brandon Adair. This link right here is only in here one time for, for John. This second row that we have is the same contact ID, but this is that second phone number, which is an SMS phone number for John. So 
for this for this contact two two five one seven six that's the id it's one of the reasons why i put it in here so that i can put a link between these two rows because you may have two different people called john adair um, has two phone numbers i've got both of their phone numbers here this one is their preferred number this one is their sms number so two different phone numbers with two very different purposes um, but both of these records are still assigned to um, assigned to Brandon Adair. Brandon Adair is um, the student that is associated to John. So really good example about how that works. And this is an active account. So we have the is active flag is true. Primary email address, here's the email address is true. Um, the preferred phone number is right there. And then of course the student and uh, the student is in here as well. Okay. Um, that is exporting out of the data export manager for just a simple extract and then doing it based off of a contacts based extract. What I'd like to do, unless I get stopped and, uh, you know, uh, Rob, Tessa, Justin, stop me if, uh, if there's anything that I need to address. I, I'm not really keeping an eye on the, um, on the Q&A or anything like that. I'm going to go ahead and move into the Tim's extract. So for the Tim's extract, I'm going to move to a different server here. Um, I'm using one of our QA servers. I'm not going to pull up any um, any data here because this is being recorded, and I don't want to show any um, any data that may be related to a real person. So I'm not going to pull up any data, but I am going to show you the process. Um, so with Data Export Manager, extracting some of the uh, the Tim's data. So we have moved all of this, and this is actually available in all of your servers. Um, it was specifically created for the big LEAs, for the LEAs that had more than 45,000 students, um, but it is available in all of your instances if you'd like to use this instead. So this is out there. Um, I think for, for the time being, and Rob can correct me if I'm wrong, for the time being, we want the LEAs that have less than 45,000 students to continue using the same method that you have been using in the past, um, but at some point we will be migrating over to this particular extract. Um, okay, so inside of here, we have um, our category, which is going to be, instead of PowerSchool data sets, we have an additional data sets in here. Um, and what we did is we took the query that we used to build the Tim's extract in the, um, in the way that we've been doing the Tim's extract for years. We took that same query and we converted it to what we refer to as a power query, which is basically taking a SQL query, putting it into the system, and you remove some of those limitations that we have with the, with the older methods of doing the extracts. Like we don't have to worry about the 45,000 row limitation anymore. So by using this method, we kind of eliminate that and it actually makes it a little bit quicker as well. So we'll do additional data sets, and there's going to be a lot of stuff in here, a lot of stuff related to attendance, related to calendars, career tech, evaluations, graduation planner, all these NQs. These are all power queries it used to be referred to as named queries, but we, we call them power queries out there in the uh, in the real world. Um, but we have an option in here. For Tim's extract. Now, this is meant to be a district level extract. So. I'll choose Tim's extract for district, and we have one item in here. And if you've been doing the if you've been doing the Tim's extract for any amount of time, new stu underscore dat probably makes sense to you. Um, at the at the very beginning, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but uh, I've just learned that that is just the uh, just the way that it was named. That's the file name, new stu. Um, so that's that's what we uh, that's what we use to here just for consistency, just for uh, familiarity. So that that remains the same. Um, now, you're not going to see any any weird options in here, like you're not going to see the first name, the last name, the alternate addresses, their phone numbers. That's all built into the query. So you're not going to have all of those different options here, mostly because the Tim's extract is a positional file layout and not a comma delimited or tab delimited or anything like that. Uh, so we just have this one column here that we use for the extract because everything is really put into one column with a, with a number of spaces between um, each value. So not going to make any changes here. Just going to select new stu underscore dat. Don't need to change anything here because you'll find out why here in just a moment. We're not going to actually use a label on the extract. So here 
Um, I don't want to do any filters, right? We're going to leave this exactly the way that it is. We're not going to make any changes on this screen. And we're going to go to our last screen, which is, um, which is going to be the screen that's going to eventually show us because it actually has to run the query to tell us how many records are going to be exported. Um, so we're going to see that here in just a minute. And we're going to enter in some options. Of course, we're going to name the file. Here, I'll give this, there it is. So I have 264 here that are going to be extracted. I'm going to, of course, change the name here to new stew.txt. I'm going to keep this as a carriage return. A field delimiter, because this is such a weird file layout, I'm going to change this to other, and I'm going to put a little asterisk in here. So this is a special setting for the Tim's extract. As I mentioned before, the settings that are in there by default fit most scenarios, but in this particular case, we do have to set this in a specific way. We're going to leave this as Windows ANSI. We're going to uncheck both of these boxes because we do not want to include column headers, and we certainly don't want to make any changes to the file because it's positional. If you put a, if you put a field quote at the beginning, everything is off by one character. We don't want that. Leave it unchecked. Leave these all unchecked. So what I did is I changed the file name, I changed the field delimiter to other, put it in asterisk, made sure these two boxes are unchecked, and now we're ready to uh, to perform our export. I can click on that export button, and here after after a few moments, it's going to perform that extract. Um, the nice thing about this, and again, if you have been involved in doing the Tim's extract. Um, you know that you right click and go to save link as and you just kind of sit there and wait for a while. If you're a bigger LEA, you wait for a, for a longer while um, and you really don't know if it's actually doing anything. But if you saw when I clicked on the extract, it actually said, hey, please wait, I'm actually doing something right now. So that's um, that's something that you will get um, by using this method. And you can see I have my file here, which I will not open, um, but I have all of the data there. And at that point, it would be ready to send over to um, to the TIM system for processing. Something else that you can do here, um, you know, of course, I can save this as a template, right? So if I want to have a TIMS extract, I can save this as a template. So I have my TIMS extract. Um, I've got, oh, right, right. We have issues in our QA server because I am logged in as, um, I'm logged in as maintenance. I'm not logged in as a real user, so I can't save this as a template. But um, you can save this as a template so you don't have to go through all of those settings again. You just go into your template and then just, just run that template. One more thing that you may be able to do in the future is actually schedule these things to run automatically. So I'm not going to get into all of that because that gets a, you know, a lot more advanced. There's a lot of things that go into that, like setting up an SFTP server and all of that, having a location for the file to be routed to. Um, so there's a lot that goes into that. but um, but ultimately, we would love for this to be an automated um, an automated means. Now we're working on that. We're getting there. Um, but there's just some some things that we have to work through to make that happen. Um, so one step at a time, you know we go from uh, from the right click, save link as to the data export manager, save it as a template so you don't have to go through all of these steps every single time. And in some cases, I think there are districts out there that do this every single day. Um, so this is going to be taking a lot of steps out of that process. You just go into data export manager, go into your templates, run the template extract, and then you're done. Um, but of course, that last step to make this all automated so the users don't have to go in every day and maybe only check in periodically and make sure that their extracts are running successfully and uh, it's, it's good to go at that point. And that would become a system template as well. So if you set up a scheduled template, um, uh, you know, you've got your your templates right here that you can go in and run, but the scheduled templates, their system templates, um, you know, other people would be able to go in there and see that and troubleshoot them and even run them if they need to be ran um, as like a one off in the middle of the day, you would be able to do that as well. So lots of things that you can do here inside of Data Export Manager. Um, the best thing that you can do is go in there and just kind of play with some of the uh, some of the options, because as I mentioned, you know, as far as the PowerSchool data sets, there's lots in there. As part of the additional data sets, you can see there's lots in here. Um, you can go and uh, and check out some of these things as well and, uh, you know, just learn a little bit more about what, uh, what's included in those. 
So with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, and stop sharing my screen. I'll turn it over to Justin, and of course, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you guys have. All right, thank you. Are there any questions that we need to address now? Um, Francine, I see your question about um, the Tim's clerks, and we are working internally. Um, there will be training provided to those folks. Tessa, are you seeing other questions? I don't think I see them all. Um, I think one I've seen a couple times is, do we know when that Tim's option will be pushed to data export manager in production? It should be there now. Okay. Um, do they, if they are not seeing it, is that a ticket or, or is it maybe still going? Yes, yeah, so if they're not seeing it inside of the additional data sets, then um, that, that, that drop down would I, if the drop down is completely empty. So if there's nothing there, it's a security thing. Um, we could we could you know have a ticket to fix that. Um, if that drop down, that second drop down does have items in it, but it doesn't have Tim's extract, um, then yeah, open up a ticket and we can check your instance and just to make sure that that uh, that extract is loaded. Okay. Are you able to see my screen now? Yep. Okay. I'm going to go back. I did not mention that on this student contact screen, the the Tim's extract documentation there, that's linked to a um, document that Lorenzo put together and shared. So everybody should have access. I think I made it to where it was accessible to everybody that has a link. All right, I'm going to leave it there while we review the questions. Um, but again, we're going to we'll go through all the questions that were submitted and put together a Q and A to share out on Friday with the video to this presentation. And Dustin, I would like to answer one question. Okay. Um, when can they start using that new Tim's extract? Is that something we want them to wait for, or is that something we think they can shift to early if they choose? Well, we've already got some folks that came in and helped pilot this who are using it, and they they like it better. So, I mean, if if anybody wants to start using it now, I don't I don't think there's an issue there. Unless anybody else on the call, disagree. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you guys would want to make sure that your contacts page is pretty well up to date before you make that switch, right? Right. We're talking about the uh, the Tim's extract. Yes. Yeah. So as of right now, the uh, the old and the new are still pulling from the uh, from the original location. Um, you know, we're working on moving that Tim's extract to the new contacts, but that's probably not going to be completed until the end of next week, and then it needs to be tested and pushed out. So, um, so both of them should be identical. Um, the biggest, uh, the biggest changes for the bigger districts as far as uh, speed goes. Simple. All right. Um, I was asked to remind. You guys, um, I didn't put the GPA automation in this presentation because we reviewed that in September. So everybody knows we've got the GPA grade scale lockdown coming um, July of next year. But there is a webinar, a Q&A webinar that'll be held. I think maybe there's two webinars on Monday, December 7th. If you'd like to join, uh, there's one for charters and one for LEAs. And Tessa, John, are there other presentations or webinars coming up that this crowd would need to know about. Um, we do have a discipline data reporting um, recording that is coming up soon, along with a Q and A for that. Okay, Lorenzo, I think Alex dropped, but I've, I've been getting text messages and emails asking for the Power School slides. Do you think that's something we can get? Yes, yeah, no, absolutely, we can do that. All right. We did good on timing today. Thank you, Lorenzo, for joining. I'll be sure to follow up with Alex. Appreciate him getting Victor together at the last minute to do the 
upgrade overview. I think that was very helpful. And thank everybody else for joining. We had a good crowd today. Um, if there are questions that we didn't get to or questions that you didn't put in the chat that you need answers to, feel free to just email me or the home base team. Um, we'll be sure to get you a response. Rob, do you have anything to add in the wrap up? No, I appreciate everybody's work that they've done. Justin, thank you for putting this together. And John and Tessa, thank you for helping. Uh, I appreciate everybody out there. And again, enjoy the rest of your week and, and get some rest next week. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and end this. And like I said, I'll send out um, a Q&A along with the slides and a recording of the presentation on Friday of this week. Thank you all and have a happy Thanksgiving.